is always kind of taught to dream big and think like a leader. How can we hack the system? We are producers to its core. We're makers. That was that moment where I was like, yes, like this was a big one to put us on the map. Creativity is messy. Perfect is boring. That to me is good creative. That to me is success. You can see talent in people. We want to go create the next best brand in the world. This is who we are and this is what we do. This is Creatives Off Script. Welcome to the Creatives Offscript podcast hosted by Assemble. I am your host, Nate Watkin, and today I'm excited to bring in Aaron Goodsell, the head of production for Mother, a self-described, fiercely independent creative agency and winner of AdAge's International Agency of the Year. Aaron cut her teeth working as a producer for the likes of White and Kennedy, 72 and Sunny, and Deutsch, producing work for the world's best brands, including Nike, Coke, Verizon, Airbnb, and many more. Welcome to our podcast, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we talk to a lot of directors, creative directors, but I am excited to finally talk with a real producer, or in your case, head of production. Unlike a director where your career rises based on your portfolio and industry buzz, what makes a successful producer in this industry? Um, it's That's kind of a, a difficult question to answer as the first one. I apologize for that. It's it's really what you're excited about, and if you're pursuing what you're excited about and you're organized enough to figure out how to do it, that makes you successful. It's just not an easy one to answer. Yeah, that makes sense. And so piggybacking off that and getting into excitement around your career, um, tell me a bit about your origin story. Like, where did this all begin? When did you decide you wanted to be a producer? And uh, how did you first break into the industry? Okay. Well, I grew up on the East Coast. I was born in Massachusetts and kind of grew up in New Jersey. I went to art school at Rutgers University, and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do after that. And I, through a headhunter, found myself at Emirati Puris Lintas in New York. And I was working in account management, and my amazing mentor in that first position said that I needed to be a producer, that I was too creative uh, to be an account person, sorry, account people, but that I, <laughs> <laughs> I had the organizational skills and, and sort of craftiness to, to be a producer. And so she hooked me up with Ozzy Spenningsby, who was my first real production mentor. And anyone who knows who Ozzy Spenningsby was, he, he passed away sadly a couple years ago. There's probably about five active heads of production currently now that have worked for Ozzy at one time or another. And he instilled great things in all the people that worked for him, that we have amazing production partners. They're not just vendors, uh, facilitating relationships with everyone, the making sure that you're working hard and being nice to everyone. So much more than that, he was so beloved and respected, and we just kind of gleaned so much from him. So that was kind of like my jump off from there. So I was in New York at Emirati Puris Lintas. And then I was there for a good amount of time through a bunch of different mergers with IPG. And then I went through some personal stuff and decided to kind of move west and see what the West Coast had to offer. And through some uh, mutual friends, found myself at a company called Triple Double that worked with mostly the NFL network. They did some other stuff with the NFL League, but I really sort of cut my teeth on working with athletes and celebrities at Triple Double. And I was a bit like production boot camp, like learning how to maneuver and being able to deal with really fast turnarounds and being able to, you know, not panic in a crazy situation and just solve problems creatively. So that was really exciting. And then after that, I was freelancing. So I freelanced at a few places. Of course, this is at the time of the crash. So it was kind of hard to get in the door anywhere. So I was freelancing actually in New York a bit. But ultimately, I ended up freelancing at Wyden and Kennedy. And the first job I worked at at Wyden and Kennedy was with uh, Joe Staples, who is now the CCO of Mother. But it was their first Dodge job. And I was the producer and I was so excited. I felt like this is it. I've made it. I'm working on a White and Kennedy job. And it was a really incredible experience. So I was able to stay on after that. 
And the next job I was supposed to do for Wyden and Kennedy was going to be a Nike job, which was even more exciting to me because as every young producer knows or feels that, you know, once you do a Nike job at Wyden and Kennedy, that's it, you're, you're set. And then unfortunately, yeah. that job went away and Ben Grillowitz, who is the then head of production of Wyden and Kennedy said, well, I'm going to put you on this project that's going to shoot over Christmas break. It's for Old Spice. Would you? Are you available to do it? And I was, you know, crestfallen because I was so excited to do this Nike project. Little did I know it was the man your man could smell like. So I had seen this script and I didn't quite know what to make of it. And I was excited because we were bidding really exciting directors for it. And ultimately it was ended up being Tom Koontz, who's a genius. And uh, Eric Kalman and Craig Allen are wonderful to work with. But it was quite the experience. Anything from, you know, there was a swell. We had to move the boat set 150 yards from the shoreline because it was going to get washed away. So, like, weeks before we even filmed, like, we were already, like, um, $80,000 over. And then when we, <laughs> uh, we had the good fortune of... of finding and casting Isaiah Mustafa, who's so wonderful and a legend. But like in the middle of the shoot, he almost got killed by the bathroom set because it was held up by a crane and the winch failed and then the safety winch failed and then the bathroom set came crashing down into the boat set. And Isaiah being so agile, he felt like a difference in the wind and he took a step to the left and missed being smashed by the uh, bathroom set. So that was kind of crazy. And then, wow. it, and a lot of people know this story about the 57 takes to get to the one, one take. It was done in one take. I can, I can corroborate that. And it was 50, I think it was take 57. And we got to take 57 because during the shoot, it rained one day. And so we had a half a day of shooting, which ended up being a rehearsal. But that third day was the magical day that we got it. And then... You know, once it was in the can, we were all really excited that we actually were able to do it. But the clients were kind of afraid of it because it was so weird that, you know, they didn't want to run it during the Super Bowl after like legions of people and were working night and day to try and make it happen. But we still didn't know how crazy successful it would be. But it was definitely one of the highlights of my career for sure. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the most memorable campaigns in advertising, and it definitely spawned so many spinoffs, especially, you know, in the YouTube generation, you think of Dollar Shave Club and all, all these types of ads that really felt inspired by that. It's funny, I, I met Eric back in the day, and he had told me a bunch of crazy stories about the production of that as well. So very exciting to work on, but it sounds like there was a lot of setbacks. I mean, you had the swell of the ocean, you had the bathroom set being destroyed. I mean, what were the... The overages on this on this project, oh, like I don't remember, but they were pretty substantial for a thirty second commercial. I think it's one of the more expensive thirty second commercials. That's a lie. That's not true. There's definitely more expensive ones, but more about the talent. But they were significant. Sure. But the all of the people that were you know working on it, we were all in it together, and everybody really held hands to make it happen, including the client at the end. Of course, yeah. And at the end of the day, well worth the cost given the exposure that brought about. So tell me a little bit about the transition from the freelance producer to coming on to Mother as head of production. How did that happen? And also, what are the differences in your mind between being a freelance producer versus staff producer? Yeah, um, I really like that question because I really enjoyed being a freelance producer for the time that I was. I guess it was maybe on and off for like 11 years. I enjoyed it because I was able to be very singular and devote my whole life into crafting one job at a time, which I really enjoyed. However, I did sort of, I missed the camaraderie of being in an office and being part of something bigger than just me in my own little silo. And I also missed developing younger producers and helping them on their way. So I freelance at a few places, mostly you mentioned earlier, I was staff in the middle of it at 180, and then I went back to freelance again. And I kind of thought that my next move would be going to the production company side. But then I never really found an opportunity that spoke to me. 
And then I guess uh, it's almost four, it's four years ago, I saw that uh, Joe Staples, again, mm-hmm. full circle, had gone to Mother. Mm-hmm. And I sent him a note because I've had a crush on Mother, you know, since the late 90s when I got my little hands on the manifesto. And I wrote him a note, you know, congratulations. And then a couple months later, he called me and he said, when are you going to stop freelancing? And I said, I guess now. <laughs> because... <laughs> You know, working with Joe has always been such a joy because the first time I worked with him, I remember thinking to myself, I've never seen anybody be able to like solve a problem like that so elegantly and succinctly in that moment and having an opportunity to be around Joe all the time. When I was working on and off at Wyden and Kennedy, as he ascended, I would have less, you know, less FaceTime with Joe. And so to have an opportunity to kind of like be a lieutenant and help do the best creative work in the world and sort of shape a culture of a place sounded extremely ideal to me at this point. Yeah, that is a exciting opportunity. And it sounds like now you made the transition, like you said, from working on one project, dedicating your focus to now you're running multiple productions at once, overseeing producers, I assume. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of our listeners are really interested in process and how some of the world's best production companies run. So I'm just curious if you can give us a peek inside Mother and maybe give us some insight into how you operate a production department, if there's anything special that you do to really create a world-class production organization. Well, I think it really starts with the people. I think if you find producers who share your values about making the best creative in the world while being a good human and, and, and trying to be innovative how you do it, I think you can't go wrong. You just have to get out of the way. So it starts with people first. I mean, we're an agency and not a production company, and I think the lines are blurred in that more and more as we locate you know, makers that are sometimes outside of the regular um, production company construct. But I think it really comes down to how we all work together and finding people who are really excited about making amazing creative. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. So obviously our entire world has changed a couple of years now ago. Seems crazy to say that. But the COVID pandemic really, really affected production and just changed the way that our entire industry thought about producing content. And so I'm curious, how has remote production changed your workflow? Well, it's definitely changed the workflow. Um, When we started and we had to figure out how to shoot things remotely, it seemed so crazy. And now it seems so crazy that it was so crazy. We've gotten pretty good at it. I think the industry as a whole has gotten really good at making things remotely. You know, people have really come to the table with a lot of solutions of how to really experience it as if you were almost there. And we all just kind of like through trial and error, we got to a place where we could we could make the same amount of work in a remote way without having to leave the house. I do feel like we are missing a little bit of the special sauce, as you said before, from having some in-person collaboration. But we've definitely, like especially on clients like Sonic, We've really like been able to make it into a machine of shooting things remotely, sending like a very small team out to the actual production while we have everybody else in on by Zoom. And then we've gotten to the place where we are just posting edits and finishing and we don't need to go to a, a live session anymore. I think it'll probably stay somewhat similar to that process with some additional in-person collaboration. But I think now we're like working faster than ever in these new ways while not like messing up the creative output. Yeah, it's just so funny to think how production was 10 years ago. I mean, I heard stories of clients helicoptering in Mr. Chow's on the set, you know, and he's yeah, just that's, extravagant. <laughs> that's definitely not uh, the thing anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but it does just feel more efficient now, right? But I, I can understand you are missing a little bit of that personal touch. I think so, um, yeah. I haven't seen Mr. Chow's in 20 years, though, so I think that's that's a little <laughs> bit like maybe more maybe sugar fish. <laughs> there you go. 
There you go. A little more uh, budget friendly. Yeah, exactly. No, I don't think anybody's helicoptering anything anymore. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it's definitely leaner. We definitely have to make a lot more assets uh, for a lot less money. There's a lot more channels and platforms that we need to be considering when we're doing content captures. So it's like, how do we optimize how to capture all of this content while keeping people safe. And then as things start to open up and we start to feel a little bit safer, how do we get to a little bit uh, more of a normal production situation while still keeping some of the optimizations that we've discovered along the way? Yeah, totally. Out of curiosity, what do your collaboration tools look like? Well, like what remote tools have you adopted? Uh, well, we've definitely been doing cube take. But mostly Zoom and then having, you know, in camera be one of the squares in your Zoom that we're all observing as we as we do as we go through. Um, And then in editorial, I've been mostly doing links. I haven't been in that many live edit sessions. Uh, I know a lot of people who have been, but mostly we've been doing it through postings. Yeah, it makes sense. And so. Mother is a bit of a hybrid. I mean, obviously creative agency, but has a head of production yourself on staff. I assume a pretty robust production uh, department and capabilities. Have you ever considered repping a roster of directors? Um, well, we don't necessarily do that at Mother, but at Super Bloom, which is Mother Industries production company, they have kind of a network of, I don't know, like something like 300 creators at their disposal that they can tap into at any time. So it's not so much mm. part of Mother uh, mother LA as it is of Mother Industries. That's a pretty interesting model there. So you have like through Mother Industries, a, a creative network that essentially is like approved creative talent or how does that work? Well, they bring their partners to us as needed, like by by the project, and it's at Super yeah. Bloom is the name of that arm. Producers, are you sick of messy projects, outdated calendars, hundreds of email chains, and lost files? Have you dreamed of one tool that can bring your entire production workflow together in one place? Assemble is the project management platform designed by producers for producers featuring calendars, task lists, call sheets, asset management, and more. Assemble helps industry-leading production companies, agencies, and brands streamline their content production workflow. Try Assemble today using the code OFFSCRIPT, that's one word, to get your first month free. Learn more at assemble.tv. You are listening to the Creatives Offscript podcast. So I saw you launched a really cool new office space. Curious how you guys are thinking about office space as well in this pandemic. Is it something that you still feel is important in terms of winning jobs to have a cool creative space to bring clients to and to you know attract employees? Or does a, a remote model work for agencies in this new age? Um, well, we've been remote up until about a month ago, and we have started going back to our current office doing the 3-2 model, three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the office, Thursday, Friday, remotely. And it's going really well. I, I was really nervous about people wanting to come back to the office, but seeing the, you know, the collision of creative folks with people in IT to the mothers to uh, business affairs, just everybody getting into the same space together. The energy and excitement of people being back together is palpable. Mm -hmm. And I I really truly believe it will lead to even better work than we were doing before. Yeah, I think that is really important for a creative company. makes a lot of sense. So just more fun questions. Yeah. Craziest production story ever outside of, you know, the crazy old spice shoot. Yeah. What other crazy things have happened to you? Uh, well, it's, that one's tough too, because I can't mention a lot of crazy production stories by name because they incriminate people or not necessarily incriminate because there's celebrities and athletes or production companies or whatever. But I can tell you that, um, any producer who listens to this will groan in agreement that about 80% of every production, especially if it's overseas, will never receive the product it's supposed to be advertising in time for the shoot. 
<laughs> and that you have to kind of either put people on planes at the last minute or download some artwork and try to apply it to something that's available to you local and fix it in post. I've had, um, yeah. I've definitely been on more than one occasion on a shoot where the product that somebody was wearing didn't show up and had to be helicoptered in after we've been shooting the celebrity for an hour and a half with the celebrity director. I've definitely had that happen. I've been on a shoot where the client wanted us to use different food than what they sold. That was a crazy, <laughs> crazy one. I did not sign the producer's affidavit and it was a long time ago, but yeah, that was a crazy one. But yeah, there's been some wild rides, but it's it's super exciting to, I don't know, you get kind of addicted to the crazy ones because you're like, all right, how am I going to handle this one? And it's really fun to try and figure it out, even though you kind of lose some years off your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to approach it, though. I think that's a... Uh producer mindset to the core so not a lot of people think that way yeah it's it's fun and then also you have the you know the other opportunity of being able to tell your parents where where they're going to see your ad because that's the thing that you go home at the holidays right and they go what are you working on and you and you say and they actually recognize it is that feels pretty good yeah that's very cool so for the sixth year in a row you've been named as one of the top companies that creatives want to work for what do you think makes working at Mother so great? I think it's the combination of what you said at the top about it's a fiercely independent agency that puts creativity first and it also champions being a good human and working with good humans. I think that we, we walk the talk and I think that is seen every day in our halls or our virtual Zooms seem to be our halls all the time. Yeah, amazing. And would love to know more about that culture. And I don't know if you have any funny or heartfelt office stories. Like, would love to just get a little bit more sense of what it's like working at, uh, at Mother. Um, I can tell you that my second day at Mother, almost four years ago, was the summer, it's like the summer party. And it was at Paradise Cove in Malibu. And we all had like matching robes. We were, there was some theme. I can't remember the theme, but it was really funny. And everybody was super into it. And we got on a bus and we went up there. And there were all sorts of like team building games and stuff like that. But towards the end of that day, the leadership team offered the two summer interns full-time jobs there on the spot that day. And it was such a, a moving moment uh, to me at the time, everybody kind of got misty and it was really, really sweet. Um, and I was like, all right, I've made the right choice here. Yeah. It's a great bonding moment. Yeah. And I'm sure all the, uh, up and coming creatives out there will probably want to know is mother hiring. (laughs) Oh yeah, definitely. I think pretty much every department and, uh, this is going to be a pretty pivotal, really groundbreaking year for us. We're going to be pitching very aggressively. We have really amazing clients that we're doing a best of class work for. So it's an amazing time to come to Mother right now. Yeah, great to hear. And so last question, you know, looking back in your career, if you could talk to a younger you fresh out of college or just any young person that really wants to break into the industry and become a producer, what do you think is the number one piece of advice that you would give them? Uh, there's a couple things. I, I think I mentioned before that my first mentor instilled in me is I work hard and be nice to everyone. I personally have worked with people who are my peers that went on to be a vendor and then left to become a, my client. Uh, and I've been their vendor and vice versa. So you never know who you're going to be working with in the future. And you have to work really hard no matter what. This is a, this can be a very tough job, but it's extremely rewarding and enriching from a creative and an intellectual standpoint. And you meet the best people on the way. So I would say I would say that, and then find what you're passionate about, and get organized. Find out who's doing the work that you want to do. Find out who the vendors are and partners that they work with are. Like explore all of those things. Talk to as many people as you can 
and just keep at it, keep plugging away. And if you show the desire that you want to be somewhere, especially if it's a creative place, you're going to do well. They're going to take you and you're going to go. Amazing. Great advice. And thank you so much for the wonderful interview. It was really great to chat with you. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and comment to help us spread the word. You can also find more insider content on the Assemble blog, and you can find me on all channels at Nate Watkin. And don't forget, if your producing team is in need of a project management solution, try Assemble today to streamline your production workflow. Our listeners receive their first month free by utilizing the code OFFSCRIPT, that's one word, at checkout. You have been listening to the Creatives Offscript podcast hosted by Assemble. 